Hi there. I'm Liz Rice. Uh, I'm from Aqua Security and we help enterprises uh, keep their container deployments, their cloud native deployments secure. And uh, what I want to talk about today touches on security, um, also touches on, on other things as well. It's about why small container images are a really good thing. Um, I'm pre-recording this session, but I really hope that uh, there's going to be lots of questions and, and interaction around this um, as, it's, as it's broadcast. Uh, so looking forward to some questions from you. Um, in order to talk about why container images should be small, I need to set the scene and talk about what's inside a container image in the first place. Then we can move on to why small images are a good idea and how you can make your images small. So you're probably um, familiar with using containers with Docker. So for example, you, you may know that you use Docker pull to get an image from a registry and pull it to your local machine. Docker pull gives you a quite, quite an opaque um, representation of a container image. Um, but inside that image, uh, you would find there's basically two sets of information. There's a root file system, um, which when you instantiate your container, the container gets a copy of that, essentially a copy of that root file system. So the directory structure and all the files that are um, described by the container images root file system. And then there's also some configura configuration information included in the container image. So things like what resource limits might be imposed, um, what uh, environment variables um, you might want to define to pass into that running container. Now, all of that configuration information can be overridden at runtime. So it's, it's there as a kind of default set of settings, but it's... Um, you, you can change that, but you can't really change the uh, the file system information that's inside the container image. So that's really what we're going to focus on today. Now, Docker pull gives you this quite opaque representation of Docker images. So just to make it easier to see what's inside an image, I'm going to show you some OCI image um, format. So uh, I'm going to use a tool called Scopio to take a Docker image and convert it into what's called the OCI distribution format. So uh, these days, if you were using container D and it was pulling an image from an OCI compliant registry, it's going to get something in this distribution format. And then if container D were to ask run C, uh, the, the runtime to create a container based on that uh, distribution format would actually first need to be converted into a runtime bundle um, which is a kind of unpacked version of the image as we'll see shortly and i'm going to use a tool called imochi that can do that unpacking step for us all right so let's Let's take a look. Right, let's copy uh, a Docker image. I'm going to use Ubuntu, just a sort of the latest version of the Ubuntu base image. And I'm going to convert it to OCI format. It's going to go in a directory called Ubuntu, and I'm going to give it the latest tag to match the, the latest tag on Docker. And that's just going to take it couple of seconds to uh, make sure I've got the latest version of Ubuntu locally and that's created an Ubuntu directory and inside that there's a couple of files and there are some blobs the blobs are really where this uh, file system information lives so let's look inside there there's actually only one uh, directory in there called SHA-256 and inside there, I'll find some files. And let's just check what kind of files they are. I'll just take the first one as an example. That is gzip compressed data. 
These are blobs of compressed data that when expanded will form the uh, directory structure of our container. So uh, I'm going to unpack that image. This is uh, exactly the same directory um, on the same virtual machine, but I just need to be root for this step. Um, so I'm going to unpack that Ubuntu image. It was tagged latest. Uh, I need two dashes there. And uh, I'm going to call that Ubuntu bundle. This is converting from the distribution format into that runtime bundle. So now I have a, an Ubuntu bundle directory, and inside that I have a root file system, root fs directory, and that contains all the directories that you would expect to find in the root of an Ubuntu distribution. Now, you know, if you were on a virtual machine running Ubuntu, that's the directory structure you would expect to see. And that's what the container, if we instantiate that container, uh, is, going to, uh, is going to have within it. So let's just do that. We'll go into that bundle directory, and then I'm going to use run C to run. Um, by default, it will run from the the current directory, so from this Ubuntu bundle, and I'll just run a shell. You can see from the prompt changing that I'm inside a container. We can just take a look at the running processes that are visible. We can see it. It is a container. We can't, we can't see anything else running outside that, um, that container. And let's just look at that root file system it matches exactly what we saw in the, in the bundle. So uh, that's kind of showing the, the fact that we have this root file system inside the, um, uh, inside the container image. Okay, now one of the reasons why an Ubuntu image might be um, bigger than you necessarily need is because it comes pre-installed with a number of um, packages. So if I use apt to look at those packages, we can see there's a ton of packages that come pre-installed by default. Um, if we want to um, reduce the size of our image, one of the things we might look at is whether or not we need all of those packages. So we'll come back to that. Okay, we just looked at an Ubuntu image and the size of that image, um, the, the Ubuntu latest, is 74 megabytes. You might have heard of a distribution called Alpine to cut down Linux distribution designed to be used as a minimal small base image for containers and it's six megabytes. And the choice of base image, so the choice of that kind of underlying Linux distribution that you use, makes a huge difference to the size of an application container. I took Nginx as an example. So the, the standard Nginx image is based on Debian, and it's 127 megabytes. There's also a version that's based on Alpine. Um, it's an official Nginx image. And it's you know, 20 megabytes, it's kind of a sixth the size of the, um, the, the default one. So if small images were what you were aiming for, you might want to look at using that Alpine-based version rather than the, the sort of the standard one. Which leads me on to this question of why small images are better in the first place. And one reason is um, simply the cost of or the time requirement to pull large amounts of data. It's going to take a lot longer um, to pull that um, Debian based version of Nginx than it would the version. It's going to take six times longer to pull the Debian based version than it would to pull the Alpine based version because the amount of time is roughly speaking proportional to the size of data that we're transferring. 
And every time you pull an image, you're going to have to transfer some data. If you're running on a cluster of machines, every time that image needs to be run on a particular node, the image is going to have to be transferred to that node. So that's going to take some network traffic. That's potentially going to take some time. I also wanted to mention um, the Kubernetes image pool policy, um, which um, I would recommend using always as the default, because then that way, every time you run a container, you make sure you've got the latest version of that particular container image, and you're not relying on whatever happens to be locally uh, cached on that node. Okay, so talked about how small images make it faster to move an image around the network and move the image to where it needs to be instantiated. But there's another really strong reason to prefer small images, and that is to do with security. So we talked about these two parts of the container image, the file system and the configuration. Now, the configuration could be set up insecurely, I'm not really going to talk about that today because you can override that at runtime anyway. The file system could contain files that have known and exploitable vulnerabilities. And when I talk about vulnerabilities, I mean these package, or particularly mean these package vulnerabilities. So known exploitable uh, problems in software packages that attackers can exploit to do bad things on your system. So they could be these really serious and, and well-known ones like Shellshock and Heartbleed. Um, there are thousands of other vulnerabilities and some of them uh, can enable attackers to do bad things. Um, so you wanna make sure that they are, that the images that you're running don't have these known vulnerabilities. One way to check your image for vulnerabilities is with a vulnerability scanner. And I want to give out a shout out for Trivi, which is an open source vulnerability scanner that my team works on. Um, and uh, it's, it's really high performance. It covers a lot of uh, different um, base images, um, a lot of different operating systems. Um, so uh, I, if you're not already using a vulnerability scanner, I would thoroughly recommend you to check out Trivi. Generally speaking, the smaller the amount of code you have, the less likely it is to contain vulnerabilities. If you have no packages in your container image at all, then none of those known package-based vulnerabilities can exist you know, if there are no packages, there can't be any vulnerabilities. The more packages you have installed, the more likely it is that you might have a vulnerable package amongst them. And new vulnerabilities get discovered all the time. So even if, you're, if you have no vulnerabilities today, tomorrow something new could get discovered and um, your, one of your packages could be found to be vulnerable after all. So. The smaller your image is, the fewer, well, if you, if you have fewer packages installed, your image will be smaller and the chances are it will have fewer vulnerabilities. Generally speaking, the fewer um, executables that exist in your image, the fewer opportunities there are for an attacker to take advantage of things they could do with those executables. So, Smaller images are good from a security point of view and they're good from a performance point of view. There are quite a lot of things that you probably don't need to have in a container image. Now, I'm going to talk about some examples. I'm sure that for all of these examples, you can think of some counter examples where in a particular circumstance, you might need these things. I'm not saying you never need these things, but I am saying that in a lot of circumstances, these things that I'm about to talk about don't need to be in your container image. So think very carefully about why you think you need them. So things you probably don't need to have. My, the, the first example would be an SSH server. There, there's no reason to be um, using SSH to get into a container. 
you could be using Docker Exec or Kube Control Exec if you want to access a running container. Now, I don't really think you should be accessing your running containers in production under anything but the most extreme circumstances. You should be treating your containers as immutable, by which I mean build container images that have all of the code that your application needs. And if for any reason you need to change anything about that container, don't change it live, rebuild your container image with whatever changes you need and redeploy, the, redeploy that container. That's what we mean by treating your containers as immutable. You probably don't need things like logging running directly inside your container. You can just write logs to stand it out and use um, tools, cloud native tools to collect those logs and do the appropriate things with them. Or maybe you're going to have a sidecar container um, you know, inside the same pod that handles logging for you. I don't think there's any reason to have things like syslog inside a container though. Cron is a really interesting example. Now, in Cloud Native, of course, you may have things that need to run to a schedule. But rather than starting a container and having cron inside it that then schedules jobs, Cloud Native approach would be to have a container that runs an individual job and then have orchestration layer, orchestration level scheduling to determine when to run those jobs. So you don't need cron inside the container because the orchestrator should be doing that for you. Package manager. So I've talked about how images um, may well have these packages contained within them. Do you need a package manager to manage those packages in a running container? You probably do want to have package manager uh, available during build so that you can do things like um, you know, yum install or apt install um, the packages that your application depends on. You probably don't need them in runtime. In particular, if we're treating containers as immutable, there's no reason to be changing your packages inside a running container. So you probably don't need a package manager. I will shortly talk about why you do need some package information though. Another set of things that I don't think you're really going to need in your containers, you may not need a shell. Now you might, because um, you might have uh, application requirements for a shell. I mean, your container could be running bash scripts. That, that would be completely acceptable and you would need, uh, you know, bash, present inside the container in order to run those shell scripts. That's fine. But if you have an application that doesn't need a shell, that's one less tool for an attacker to be able to take advantage of. They can't run a shell if the shell doesn't exist. If you do take the shell out of the container image, you one thing to be aware of is specifying your um, executable names or your executable commands in the non-shell form. Um, you, you'll see this on the, the Docker documentation if you, you need to look this up, but essentially enclosing your command in, these, uh, in the square brackets. If you don't have those square brackets, it's going to assume that you're going, you, it's a shell form. It wants to have a shell to execute that uh, command. Okay, packages. So there are lots of packages that may be installed by default or um, may be installed for your own convenience that you don't necessarily need in a running container. SSH, uh, good example. Curl. So maybe during your build stage, you might want to use something like curl in order to pull files or applications from some remote location into the container image. But once it's there, you don't really need to be able to run curl. And that could be a really useful tool for an attacker. So it's a good example of something you might want to not include in, a, in the final container image. 
Then how about utilities like uh, being able to list files or change the permissions on files? Maybe there are reasons why you need those um, utilities inside your uh, container image. Maybe the application has reason to do these things, um, but they are also useful for attackers. So if you don't need them, maybe you can get rid of them. That said, um, if you're using a Alpine-based uh, image, it uses BusyBox, and as you uh, may or may not be aware, BusyBox is actually one executable for all of these um, things that in other distributions can be multiple different binaries. Let me show you what I mean. Um, so if we were to run uh, an Alpine container, let's just run a shell in it. And if we look at the contents of the bin directory, the whole uh, directory is full of uh, symbolic links to one executable called BusyBox. So uh, one of the ways they've optimized the, the size of the image uh, using BusyBox, which just has this single executable. Okay. So, change my screen. Okay, so we've talked about um, why images, smaller images are better, and we've talked about some things that you might want to not have in a container image. How do you actually do achieve smaller images? Going around and deleting individual files seems like a pretty, um, you know, it's a pretty intensive thing to, to have to do. There is a tool that you could use called Docker Slim that will take your container image and produce a smaller version of it that only contains the files that are actually required by the application. So it automatically analyzes your um, image and removes anything that's unused. In doing so, it removes the package information. So let me uh, show you what I mean by that. Inside the container. Right. So you can actually run Docker Slim as an interactive tool. And um, just going to check my notes. Um, I'm going to take a um, Nginx. Yeah, I'm going to build from a target that is Nginx. Take the Nginx. I'll just take that latest one and I'm going to output uh, an image called Nginx Slim. And it just take a few seconds for Docker Slim to analyze that image um, and produce the smaller optimized version. Okay, looks like that's done and I can exit that. Now, if I look at all of the Nginx images I have locally, I've got that slim version that I just created that's around eight megabytes. So it's under half the size of the Alpine version and um, well, dramatically smaller than the original, which was 127 megabytes. So Docker Slim has been through and removed everything that it deemed to be unnecessary to run that image. Now, one of the things that it has removed is package information. So I'm just gonna run the original, Nginx latest image, and I'm going to run a shell. And uh, let's just confirm that there are some, oops, misspelled that. There are some packages installed. Yeah, so there's a, a whole load of packages installed into that Nginx uh, container image. And if I were a vulnerability scanner, I wouldn't 
I would need to know which versions of packages are installed into the image so that I can check whether each of those versions is vulnerable or not. So I'm just taking a, an example that, you know, a, a, random version, a random package here. I might look up the password package and I would be looking in my database of vulnerabilities to see whether this version 1 colon 4.5 dash 1.1 has any known vulnerabilities. And that information about which versions of packages are installed is included here in varlib the package info. Um, so let's, I'm going to, I use password as my example, so I'm just going to use p here, and you can find, you can see there's um, information here about the password package. Um, if I were to list everything, you'd see there are, there's information about all the installed packages. And this is where a vulnerability scanner would come on a Debian-based um, image to look for the installed package information. The actual form of this information and the location varies from distribution to distribution, and package manager, package manager, but for this example, it's here. So recall, this is the original Nginx image. Now, if I were to try to um, look at the installed images inside the slim version, uh, so I could try running um, apt list on that container, but actually it determined that the apt package manager wasn't really required, so it's removed it. Um, I also can't do things like run a shell into this, um, so I don't believe I can. Yeah, I can't because Docker Slim removed the the shell from that image as well. Now. Uh, I already have a version of this image that I've used. I've used Scopio and Umochi to create the runtime bundle so that we can look at exactly what's in the file system. And if we look inside, oh, I need to be rude for this. So if I look inside Nginx Slim bundle, oh, I'm still inside the container. So X type correctly, list engine X slim bundle. If I look inside the root file system, we can see it's much smaller than the file systems, you know, the several directories have been removed. Slash var is still there, but if I look inside there, there's just var cache, var log, and var run. There is no var, um, var lib. There's no, um, so let's just check the, the location. It's too far up. In, um, in the original, uh, oh, I've done the same thing again. And it was in var lib that we found the dpackage directory and the info within that. So Docker Slim has removed some unnecessary files and probably removed some uh, potential for vulnerabilities in doing so, and that's great, but it also removed the package information and that's going to make it pretty much impossible for a vulnerability scanner. So for that reason, I would exercise caution in using Docker Slim, um, particularly because, well, you could scan the, um, the fat version, the pre-slim version, and look for vulnerabilities in the packages. Um, Docker Slim isn't going to change the, the packages that exist, but you can't directly scan the slim versions, or you might, you might think you're scanning them, but you're not going to get any useful information because the package information just isn't there. Another approach, rather than, so if Docker Slim takes a big image and reduces it by taking out what's not needed, the other approach would be to start from a small base image and add in the things that you need. 
And that's the approach of a project called Distrolis from Google. And this has a, a set of uh, around half a dozen language specific um, minimal Debian base images. So depending on your language, you would use Python or Java or um, Go version of the Distrolis images. Distrolis removes unnecessary binaries, it removes the package manager, doesn't remove the packages. Um, and it's really recommended to be um, used as the final stage in multi-stage builds. So you can, here's an example taken straight from the Distrolis GitHub repo, where there's a first stage of a multi-stage build that builds a Java application, and it's, it needs the whole Java tool chain in order to do, do that. Having built the application, the second stage copies it into a base image, the, the Java version of the Distrolis base image. So anything that you only needed at build time doesn't exist in that final version of the image. If you're using a um, compiled language, something like Go that compiles to a standalone binary, you can get even smaller. You can use the scratch image. So scratch is, it's, it's not really even a base image, it's a reserved word representing an empty base image. It, there are no file system contents in scratch. So you can start from scratch in a Docker file and add in only the files that you need, particularly um, useful in the kind of um, standalone binary environment. And uh, because there's nothing else in that image, you've only got the, the files that you've added, there can't be any vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, if, if you haven't had, added something with vulnerabilities, there cannot be any vulnerabilities in that image. Um, so it's a really good way of producing extremely small images with no package vulnerabilities for standalone binary applications. So if you're using languages like Go or Rust or C, Scratch could be a great way to go. Um, uh, some reason I've got the example again here, but um, yeah, one thing to bear in mind is that if your application uses TLS directly, um, you will need to. So if it makes um, secure connections, HTTPS connections, you would need um, to install the certificate authority packages so that you can verify server certificate. So you can verify the servers are who they say they are. That's one gotcha in using the, the scratch image. Um, also, much like Distroless, you can use scratch images as the final stage of a multi-stage build. So you can have that um, uh, language-based uh, image for building the, um, the application. You might run your build within a container and then have a final stage in the multi-stage build, much like we just saw with that Distrolis example, that just copies your um, executable and any other dependencies it has, any other supporting files into the Scratch image. Now, I do think that having small images is a very good thing to aim for, particularly for performance reasons and for security reasons, but it's not the only consideration. You should also be thinking about um, the base image that you build from. If you build from a small base image, but you can't check its vulnerabilities, that's potentially something to be worried about. So um, starting from a base image that has no package information would worry me personally. Um, you want to know that whatever base images you're using are well maintained. Um, you, you might be creating problems for yourself if you use some obscure distribution that actually gets abandoned, um, that might be a problem. So just look for 
um, base images that look to be responsibly maintained. And also think about convenience for your developers. It, it's, there's no point having you know, the most optimized container images if it's painful for your developers to, to build them or to, um, to use them in, in the environments where they need to use them. And that really um, brings on to the, the fact that the recommendations for exactly what you should do depends on your, um, particularly depends on your application language. Um, if you're using a compiled uh, language like Go, something like, uh, but trying to base your uh, images on Scratch is, you know, that, that's achievable. If you're using an interpreted language like Ruby or Python, it's pretty painful to figure out exactly what all the dependencies are. You're better off, it's gonna be much more convenient to start from one of the language specific base images that already exists. You might choose to use distroless, you might choose to use the um, language official um, versions for your base image. Um, for many circumstances, multi-stage builds can help you um, optimize that final container image so that, um, for example, you don't need your um, build tools in that running container. And whatever you do, make sure that the vulnerability scanner you're using supports the operating system and more specifically, the package manager that's in use in your base image. Even if there's no package manager, you want your vulnerability scanner to understand the package information um, so it can tell which packages have been installed and check those packages for vulnerabilities. Um, so not all vulnerability scanners support all different Linux distributions. So you do want to check that whatever distribution you're using, your scanner supports it. So just to wrap up, if you want to dive more into um, best practices for um, container images and other things around improving your container security, um, I recently released this, this book published by O'Reilly on container security. Um, if you go to containersecurity.tech, that will take you to um, various places you can get hold of it. Um, including Aqua Security, where you can download an electronic copy for the price of your contact details alone. Um, so uh, I hope that book will be useful if you want to dive more um, deeply into um, things like the contents of um, container images and how you can build container images um, to be as secure as possible. With that, I hope that was an interesting um, explanation of why small container images are a good thing. If you take one thing away from this talk, I really hope it is to scan your container images for vulnerabilities. It's probably the biggest bang per buck thing you can do to improve the security of your deployments. I hope there's been lots of questions coming in and uh, I'm looking forward to answering them. So thank you very much.